Hello everyone, today we are going to do American literature and we still have Mark Twain Zuckerberg Finn with us. We are going to continue the overview and little bit of analysis of chapter 17, the Grand Gaffords take me in. This is an aristocratic family with which Huckleberry Finn has an encounter. And chapter 18, why Henry Ford away for his hat, rode away for his hat. And chapter, excuse me, 19, the Duke and the Dauphin come aboard. It's a very interesting chapter here, okay? <coughs> now in chapter 17, we have an elaborate satirical commentary on the society in which both Huck and his author spent their childhoods. Now you can see this overlap between the personality of Huck and the personality of Mark Twain. Mark Twain led um, a life that is sometimes so similar with Huck. Mark Twain himself was an ordinary boy. Ordinary boy, nobody can control him. He is like a troublemaker who doesn't listen. His presence in a place might cause trouble to people, okay? Now, these are the three elements that we're going to talk. It is a satirical satire, is a genre of literature or um, a type of literary uh, practice where society is subjected to ridicule from the part of the author. And here, aristocracy, American aristocracy in the South represented in the family of Grangford is ridiculed by him. And also in the scene that talks about the Duke and the Dauphin, these are two people, one about 70 years old, the other is less, about 30. They inadvertently come together on the raft and they orchestrate a plot um, in order to steal people's money. And how Shakespearean scenes are derived from Hamlet, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet in the course of the chapter. <laughs> As the barking dogs are directed to quiet down by a command from within the house, Huck receives suspicious directions to make his way slowly to the Granga Ford house. So he finds himself in the Granga Ford house. We've said aristocratic family and he will meet with Buck here. Once inside, Huck finds himself surrounded by men aiming pistols at him. You can see violence is the potential expected action wherever Hucks go in the American society. Suspicion is the norm here, okay? Once he is inside the house, he finds himself surrounding people, pointing their guns at him, as if he is considered a thief by them. But this has a reason, because these people are in dispute. In fact, they are in a feud with another family. Okay? Once they become satisfied that Huck is not a Shepherdson, Shepherdson is the family with which the Grangerford has feud. And this feud or battle or fight is so long. Some people do not even remember why it started and where it started, which argument that started, ignited this fight, okay? Their behavior changes radically as the men express concern for his welfare and accept his story about being an orphan who fell overboard from a steamboat. Now, as wicked as Huck is, he convinces them that he is an orphan and who he plotted 
or woven had woven this story of being an orphan who fell overboard from a steam boat is so is totally accepted by them now once they accept it they accept it they accept him in their house huck is invited to move in with buck buck is a boy in the family whose age is similar to huck's for his part, Huck forgets the hostile introduction and instead of focus, and instead focuses on what he sees as the marks of a fine educated aristocratic southern family. Now he, with open eyes, look at the ingredients, look at the architecture, looks, sorry, looks at the paintings, looks at the way they behave in their life look at the way they deal with slaves uh, look at the number of slaves how many slaves are there every person in the grand grand ford family has his own slave that waits on him in the language of Huckleberry this can tell us how affluent is their life okay while the naive Huck recounts how everything appears on the surface, Twain wants us to look beyond appearances to see the true hypocrisy of the house, such as the interior decorations. Yeah. So now Huck is stunned by the appearance, but Twain, in fact, wants the readers to look beyond appearance, to see the true hypocrisy of the house, the way in which they live, the manner they lead. And the, the, one of the most important points you need to look here is there are generations of the two families that who fight the other families without being aware what was the source of the conflict. It's just the hypocrisy of the society, which include the interior, in, the interior of the house, include outlandish chalk parrot on each side of the clock, and a cat made of crockery, a decor truly in bad taste when held up to scrutiny. If you look at it from close, you will find out that all these appearances are fake or untidy, or does not tell that these people are originally civilized or truly purely civilized. Another important detail here is related by Huck when he talks about the drawings left behind by the now deceased young Emmeline Grangerford. The drawings, okay, were done by a girl whose name is Emmeline. From Huck's perspective, the pictures are dark and gloomy. One in particular, an incomplete drawing of a young woman which is mainly concealed behind a curtain, except during the absurd celebration of Emmeline's birthday when the family hangs flowers on it. Yeah, woman is behind the scenes. She only celebrated on certain occasions after, and afterwards she's back to her own constituency, to her own dark corners where she is marginalized. And this is not only Twain's perspective, it is Huck's point of view or perspective. The pictures are dark and gloomy one in particular, and incomplete. This means that Emmeline, the deceased, deceased means she passed away. She's dead. She's no longer alive. This means that she led a dark, gloomy life, bad, sad life, where she is marginalized without communication with the surrounding milieu. Huck manages to make one insightful comment, though he says it seriously. 
I reckon that with her disposition, she was having a better time in the graveyard. Wow. She led a very sad life on, in the view of Huck that she might be better off in the grave than in her family house. I reckon that with her disposition, she was having a better time in the graveyard. You can see that <laughs> Huck is wild, innocent, and he fled, he escaped the attempt to civilize him at the hands of, Middle, of Widow Douglas. And now he is like escaping from the fire to the frying pan, okay? Now, it's, it's, really, it's really fine. It's really interesting that he, wherever he goes, he comes across people who lead fake life or fake civilized life. But he sifts through, he sees through this life, the aspect of gloomy life, dark life that is led by these people. Chapter 18 begins with Huck's straightforward appraisal of the kiln. In chapter 17, there is an interesting incident where Huck is given a name, which is George, and he cannot spell the name. In order to know how to spell the name, he enters into a game with Buck, asking him, can you spell your name? Can you spell my name? If you spell my name, then can you spell it? Are you able to spell it? It's like a challenge. And when the boy spells George's name, okay, Huck writes it down and memorizes it in case he's asked to spell his name. In chapter, in chapter 18, it begins with Huck's straightforward appraisal of the Kelnil. Kelly Grangerford, who was a gentleman, you see. He says, Huck says, he was a gentleman all over, and so was his family. And his family follows rigid rules of propriety. Propriety means politeness, um, good manner, etc., etc., including a dress code, appearance. You can see how these people are rigid or have rigid rules when it comes to appearance. Remember as Hard Bloom say, Harold Bloom says, Huckleberry Finn is about truth, is about the Americanness of the Americans, okay? But right after this description, Huck makes an alarming observation. Each person had their own nigger to wait on them. So it's a luxurious life that is led by the, the family. Every person in the family has his or her own slave who serves her or him. And he adds that the slave assigned to him had an easy time because Huck wasn't used to being waited on. Even Huck himself was granted a slave. The slaves were so many at the time. And they are cheap and they work hard. And this family is extremely rich. But because Huck is stubborn and unable, congenitally unable to be civilized according to their ways, he does his own things with his own hand, so he didn't need the slave to wait on him. Shortly thereafter, Huck relates how wonderful the Granga Fords are as he recounts a conversation in which he asks Buck about the family feud with the Shepherdsons. 
From this conversation, Huck learned several pieces of information. No coherent story, several pieces. Namely that it is not clear exactly when the feud started, when the fight started. Nobody knows. Okay? <laughs> there may be no one left who remembers what the original argument was about. Yeah, it's like Dahs uh, al-Ghabra, 40 years of fight. Okay? That a large number of people from both families have been killed in the feud and that many others have been injured. Yeah. Finally, there is the extraordinarily misplaced and inappropriate admiration which Buck has for the Shepherdsons. Oh, this is very contradictory. Buck from a family is infatu infatuated with the enemy and the murderers few they are embroiled in. By the end of this chapter, Huck finally becomes so disgusted that he can no longer relate the details lest he becomes sick himself. Yeah, you can see, he is given an, a, a gold opportunity to lead a very good life in this house, but contrary to what expected from a child, he is very wild, very innocent. Remember when, when his heart and con deformed conscious gets into feud or gets into battle, get into battle, they battle, his heart is, or his conscious, his deformed conscious suffers defeat. However, it is also important to recognize that Huck is still slow to learn the real lesson that surface appearances are exactly that and require further scrutiny. Huck also tells us in this chapter how he gets back together with Jim, who has by now repaired the damaged raft. Most of the story takes place on the raft. They get off the raft to get back to it again, you can see and on the Mississippi. We'll come to the Mississippi when we come to the analysis. Huck is very happy to escape the Grand Fords as he and Jim agree that there weren't no home like a raft after all. Yeah, home, sweet home. Their raft becomes their home. Okay, what is in a raft? It's freedom on the Mississippi. And in certain point, Harold Bloom says that there is a paragraph, we'll come to it, in Huckleberry Finn that can be, or in, in, in the words of Harold Bloom, they must be the most beautiful paragraph written in American literature. We'll come to it. And it is in the river, by the way. Chapter 19 begins with one of the longest descriptions in the book of the beauty of being on the river. Yeah, this is what we meant by this. Okay, I want you to look for this description, okay? I want you to look for this description. In fact, this is the description that is described by Harold Bloom to be the most beautiful paragraph written by an American, okay? Then the nice breeze springs up. This is part of it. And comes fanning you from over there. So cool and fresh and sweet to smell. An account of the woods and flowers. Then the nice breeze springs up breeze, Nassim, and comes fanning you from over there, so cool and fresh and sweet to smell an account of the woods and flowers. And the rest goes on. <laughs> now, in this point, Huck meets with another 
two deceptive persons. Yeah, you can see how Hakal Berifin is full of deceptive people, of cunning, wicked, foxmen. Foxmen, Afon. Hak meets the Duke and King while paddling a canoe near the shore to look for berries. One of them looks to be about 70 years old with an old buttered up slouch hat on and a greasy blue woolen shirt, while the other is judged to be about 30. These come separately, but they unify, uni get united on the raft. Dressed about as ordinary, in reality, they are two con men in a great hurry to get away from somebody, and Huck agrees to let them come back to the raft with him. Okay, now we will continue with chapter 19. Just wait for me. No, this is not the one. Sorry for that. Mm, let me look for it. Yes. So, we continue with the king and the duke, chapter 20, 21, 22. Now, in chapter 20, we see how these two con artists, I mean the king and the duke, in action as they visit a small town and steal a few dollars. Stealing is the norm in the novel, okay? You can see. In one of the most hilarious episodes in the novel, they plan a show consisting of the most memorably scenes from three Shakespearean plays. These plays are Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, and Macbeth. Let us see. The balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet in which the old man, the king, will play Juliet. Hamlet's soliloquy from Hamlet, Chapter 21, we'll come to this. And the sword fight from Richard III. Sorry, Richard III, not Macbeth. Okay? Now, the king and the duke pretend to be, one of them pretend to be an actor, the other pretend to be uh, a member of the royal family of France. And they start to conspire against Jim and to to try to cover up their escape by saying that they are taking Jim as a slave, taking him back, like they act like bounty hunters. So they can escape uh, police, okay? Or they can avoid, evade being arrested. But let us so now find, define soliloquy, which is used in the novel. Soliloquy is a dramatic speech uttered by one character speaking aloud while alone on the stage or while under the impression of being alone. The soliloquist thus reveals his own inner thoughts and feelings to the audience, either in supposed self-communion or in a consciously direct address. Soliloquies often appear in plays from the age of Shakespeare, notably in his Hamlet and Macbeth. Now these duke and king, or the king and the duke, are going to use Hamlet's soliloquy in which he states that to be or not to be, that's the question, okay? And Macbeth's soliloquy tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Now, the performances are a complete fraud designed to bilk money from 
a naive country jakes, as the Duke assures him. Now they want to perform in order to steal the money from the villages, okay, the jakes, from the people in the, the naive people of the villages. By the end of the chapter, Huck is fed up with kings. Yeah, he discovers that these people are not honest. Okay? In chapter 21, we have the two con men getting ready for the Shakespearean performance. They intend to give in the towns they visit along the river. Needless to say, true to the fraudulent character of the Duke, he does not know nearly as much about Shakespeare as he pretends, though he can easily dupe the others on the raft. Yeah, to dupe them, to deceive I mean, to dupe these people is easy because they are ignorant. They don't know what is there in Shakespeare. So whatever he says, they cannot judge him. They cannot scrutinize whether he is a liar or not. As to Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy, the Duke presents it as a hodgepodge of lines from Macbeth, Romeo, and Juliet, as well as other plays. A hodgepodge, a heterogeneous, it's, yeah, it's a mixture, okay? Hodgepodge is a mixture. Here, he mixes everything up in order to produce um, something that, through which he takes the money of the Jakes. The speech is hilarious and shows Mark Twain to be a consummate writer of parodies. Parodies, we'll come to the meaning of parodies. Parody is a literary term. But as fraudulent as it is, Huck is impressed. Although Huck is aware that they are not true, he is amused, he's impressed. It's just funny. What is parody? It's a mocking imitation of the style of a literary work or works, ridiculing the stylistic habits of an author or school by exaggerated mimicry. Parody is related to burlesque. Burlesque, parody, mimicry, all these are similar terms of one family, okay? and its application of serious styles to ridiculous subjects. So, the Oxford Concise Dictionary of Literary Terms by Chris Baldrick says that parody is related to burlesque in its application of serious styles to ridiculous subjects. And it is related to satire in its punishment of eccentricities, even to criticism in its analysis of the style. So, in part, it relates to burlesque. In part, it be relates to satire. But it is all about mimicking people, imitating people in a funny way in order to ridicule them. Okay, this is parody. This is the meaning of... Uh, let us stop here and continue afterwards. Thank you.